It's 12 o'clock now, but we are still waiting on a few more participants. We'll just uh, wait as a few more join us. And other people can join as, as they see fit. So to get things started, welcome. Uh, my name is Steve. I'm with the team at Innovate Niagara. We're happy to have you here and join us today. I know there's some familiar names that I see uh, from people in Niagara, and I know this has also been shared outside of our network um, in our provincial and national networks. Um, so for those that are joining from outside of Niagara, welcome. And to give you a little bit of a background about what we're about at Innovate Niagara, we're a regional innovation center in the province of Ontario, and we help high growth, high potential entrepreneurs start, grow, and scale. And part of that delivery is through educational workshops and training, which we are happy to provide here for you today. In uh, patent law, which is a topic that comes up a lot with our clients, and we're happy to welcome uh, Kelly Stewart, uh, who will be joining us and facilitating today. And to give you a little bit of background on Kelly, um, Kelly is a registered patent agent with the Canadian Intellectual um, Property Office and additionally with the United States Patent and Trademark Office. And Kelly's background is in engineering, so a lot of his focus is in around uh, technologies, uh, specifically in electrical, computer, software, medical imaging, uh, mechanical, and oil and gas industries. And Kelly has experience in Canada, the US, Europe, and Asia. So a pretty wide breadth of uh, experience and knowledge. And I'm looking forward, as I'm sure all of you are, to Kelly's presentation. Uh, so with that, Kelly is going to start and provide his presentation. And we just ask that you allow him to go through the presentation and hopefully he is answering questions that you may have as he goes along. And after Kelly is finished, we are going to open up uh, questions for anybody uh, who is participating. So you can feel free to put your questions in the chat. I will look out for those and then facilitate a question and answer with Kelly um, after his presentation. So with that, I will turn it over to you, Kelly. Excellent. Thank you, Steve. Um, if you could just give me a thumbs up that you can hear me okay. Excellent. Um, I just wanted to start off by thanking Innovate Niagara for hosting us today. Um, I'm looking forward to hopefully giving you guys a bit of insight onto the patent world. Um, so here's a few topics I'll be going through today. Um, do I need a patent? What is a patent? The anatomy of a patent. So basically what a patent looks like. The patent process. Um, why or what a patent can do for your company. And we get this a lot in our office. Um, a lot of people have these genius ideas for an app and they say, oh, I need to get a patent for my app. So I'll go through um, a bit of technical details as to you know, what, what features of, a, of, of an app can be, uh, can be patented. First off, do you need a patent? The answer is pretty simple. You don't. You do not need a patent to sell a product. Um, a lot of people seem to think that Oh, I need to start, um, I need to get a patent and then I can start selling this product. Technically, you don't need a patent. You can just start selling you know, any product you've come up with. However, a patent will um, help attract investors, um, protect your idea from competitors. And it's also a tool that can help you license or sell your idea to others. Um, I'm sure most of you have seen Dragon's Den or Shark Tank. Um, and a lot of times during their pitch, um, one of the dragons or sharks will ask them, well, do you, do you have a patent on this? Um, and they seem to think a lot high, more highly of the company if they do have a patent, uh, mainly because it is a tool that they can use um, to generate some revenue. So what is a patent? The legal definition is any new and useful art, process, machine, manufacture, or composition of matter. So it's probably doesn't make a whole lot of sense to you guys, but um, by the end of the presentation, hopefully that will. So how the patent kind of history happened is the government came up with this mechanism called a patent. 
And they said, we will give you a monopoly on your invention, but in exchange, you have to give us a full and complete disclosure of your invention. And that essentially is what a patent is. You're telling the world or uh, government patent offices what you invented um, and how it works, how you build it. Um, and in exchange, they say, okay, great. We will give you the exclusive right to make, use, or sell that invention. And we'll give you that term for 20 years. So essentially, if you invent something and you get a patent, let's say in Canada, that means you have the exclusive right to make, use, or sell your invention in Canada for 20 years. So for an invention to qualify as a patent, it has to have these three, um, meet three criteria. It has to be new, useful, and non-obvious. The first of those is new, which is a little more clear than the non-obvious criteria. Um, it's often referred to in our world as novelty. It has to be novel, which is another word for new. And most patent offices define novelty by the negative, where they say an invention is not new and therefore not patentable. If it was known to the public before you file your patent application. Known to the public can mean many things. It can mean it's on a website, it's in a dictionary, it's in an encyclopedia, um, someone has sold a product similar to it in the past, um, it's been on a TV show, it's been on an infomercial, it could be um, a variety of things. All it has to be is available to the public. There's no proof or no requirement that you have to prove that someone actually saw that so-called invention, as long as it was available to someone. So a classic example is I come up with the world's greatest invention and I write it in a workbook and I submit it to the Toronto Public Library and they put it on their shelf and it's available for someone to come look at it. Technically that's available to the public. Even if I had a camera on it for 20 years and I could prove that no one looked at it, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's a secret. It just means no one looked at it. It still is technically available to the public. So what if you disclose your invention to the public? Well, in Canada and the US, if you've started selling your product, you put it on your website, you put it on a Facebook post, um, anything basically outside of your kind of secret trust circle with family, friends. Um, basically, if you published your idea or sold your product, the Canadian and US patent offices give you 12 months to file your patent application. So that means if I I'll put my brand new product on Facebook. Everyone can see it, people like it, people share it with others. Um, that basically starts this 12 month window where I have to file my patent application um, in Canada and the US. Europe's a little more strict. They have a provision called absolute novelty or it has to be absolutely new. And in Europe, if you have it up on Facebook or if you've um, disclosed it in any way, you are not eligible for a patent. So as we said before, it's new, useful, and non-obvious. So useful basically means it has to have utility. And they define it as an invention is useful if it provides some identifiable benefit and is capable of use. Um, the classic example is a perpetual motion machine. There is no way that would ever work because of friction and forces and losses. Um, so you can't get a patent on something that basically doesn't have the promised utility, such as perpetual motion. So non-obvious is the gray area of the patent world. Um, it's what we spend most of our time kind of fighting back and forth with the patent office about. Basically, an invention has to be inventive. or have to have some sort of inventive step. Um, way back when, they used to call it a flash of genius, um, which basically means um, it has to have some sort of spark behind it that wouldn't have been obvious to someone if they were to look at everything else that exists in the world. So the purpose of non-obviousness is to avoid granting patents for inventions which only follow from normal product design and development. So an example off the top of my head is if you have a water bottle with a screw cap and then someone invents a wine bottle with a cork and they say, well, the problem is with this cork, I can't easily reseal my water bottle or my wine bottle. 
So what if I take this screw cap from the water bottle and put it on my wine bottle? Okay, yeah, that's great. That solved your problem. But that's not really inventive because it's doing the same thing as it did before, just on a different type of bottle. That would be a good example of if you file something with the patent office, they'll say, hey, look, like all you did is kind of take this idea from something else and stuck it on your wine bottle. Um, unfortunately, that's not inventive. So anatomy of a patent. I don't know if many of you have read a patent application or a patent before. They are notoriously long, detailed, and boring. Um, part of our craft is to um, be very repetitive and very accurate with what we call something. So if I describe a piece of paper as being piece of paper ref with a reference numeral 10 at the end, I can't call it the sheet of paper later. It has to be the piece of paper 10. And that could translate into a 40 page document of uh, basically over describing everything. So the patent application or patent um, has many sections, one of which is the background of the invention. And historically this builds up the problem that you're going to solve. So let's go back to the, the wine bottle example. Um, so I would build up the problem as being, I buy this wine, I open it up, take the cork out. I don't finish the bottle, but I want to save it for tomorrow. And the cork won't fit back in, or if it does, then it crumbles into the wine. So I have some issue with resealing wine. Um, it may reference prior art where it says, as I mentioned with the cork, some people take the cork, turn it upside down and stick it in. However, this has some problems because you know pieces of cork get into the wine. So summary, um, historically, a summary would actually be a pretty useful part of a patent application where we would kind of summarize exactly what you invented. Um, as lawyers often do through litigation, that's kind of stripped out that requirement. So basically, all they do now is summarize your patent claims, which is something I'll get to. Um, in some cases, people have said too much in the summary, which was kind of held against them, uh, basically making their patent invalid, which is something you do not want. So the next section is the disclosure or the detailed description. And this is basically how you satisfy the bargain theory. It has to be a full and complete disclosure. Um, what the patent offices look for is if you describe what is your invention and how does it work? And it has to be described in such detail that someone that works in that industry could read your specification or your disclosure and basically put the invention into practice. So they could basically build it, um, Obviously, they're allowed to have some trial and error, but they basically they can't reinvent what you invented. So they have to read your description and basically, you know, with some reasonable trial and error, be able to, be able to come up with um, your your invention. This often includes drawings, um, which some people like to frame on their wall. It's a black and white line drawing with all these reference characters. Um, in the software world it's often flowcharts um, and system diagrams of computers. So claims are the most important part of a patent or a patent application. And what they are is they're basically telling the world or the patent office what you're defining your invention to be. So if, um, try to think of a good example. You're basically building a fence around what you think you invented. So the wine bottle, let's just go with the corkscrew idea. So we would basically have um, you know, a resealable device or resealing device for a wine bottle that comprises, okay, so what does it have? It's, it's got a round body, it's got some sort of threading in it, and the threading is configured or shaped to mate with threading on the bottle so that when you rotate it in a particular direction, the two matings engage with one another and it's locked into place. So that would be an example of a, of a patent claim. <clears throat> so the patent process. So I assume some of you or most of you are listening to this because you're interested in the patent world and think, huh, I always thought about this one idea I should get a patent on. So how do I actually go about doing that? Well, the first step is to file a patent application. So that's typically done in the US or Canada. Um, and basically once you file it and the, the patent application that you file includes all the features I just described. It has to have a 
summary, a detailed description, it's got to have claims, it's got to have drawings. Um, so once that's prepared, which is a fairly lengthy process, um, we always kind of ballpark 20 to 30 hours of our time to, to draft an application. Um, but obviously it, it varies if it's um, medical imaging versus um, a corkscrew. Um, obviously one of those is a lot more detailed and involved. Um, so the, the costs kind of vary based on um, how technical the invention is. Once it's filed, it basically does nothing for 18 months. The Canadian US Patent Office say, great, you filed it, here's your filing receipt with your patent application number, and we're just gonna sit and wait. <clears throat> In 18 months after you file, it'll publish. So it basically goes on to an online database where someone can actually read your patent application. So it's only really kept secret for those 18 months, which is good and bad. Um, I'll tell you the bad part about it not publishing for that long. And that's if your competitor files a patent application today and tomorrow you wanna to do a search to see if they filed anything, there's no way anyone can find that filing from yesterday because it's not published yet. So you have to wait 18 months until you can actually find those documents which can be a bit of an issue when it comes to prior art as um, you know we get hired to search around to see if you know what someone invented is actually new we say to the best of our knowledge it is but you know be careful because if someone filed it within the last 18 months we can't find it even the patent office can't look at it, it just sits there <clears throat> so typically within the first two years of filing in the u.s um, it goes into this prosecution phase. So prosecution is a very fancy word for arguing. <laughs> so more or less, they review the submission, the patent application, and they do a search of other patents that were filed before yours, other publications. Or they might even look at your Facebook post to see if it's been published before they filed. <clears throat> and if they find any prior art that's relevant, so for example, your competitor has filed something, then they say, hey, look, we found something quite similar to what you said you did. Can you please tell us why you're different? So our job, again, is to represent you at these patent offices and say, okay, yeah, this guy described, you know, A connecting to B, but we've added this new part C that has some advantage, um, some technical advantage that would basically be the new part of your invention. <clears throat> so a lot of people also tell us that they want to get an international patent. And that's great, but there's actually no such thing as an international patent. Um, there is, however, something called an international patent application. And basically, once you file this application inter at the international office, it gives you 30 months to pick and choose which countries you want to get a patent in. It basically delays costs um, for about 30 months of time to allow you to kind of see where your industry is, you know, what markets might be important to you. And then after that 30 month window, then you say, okay, I wanna file in Canada, US, Europe, Japan, um, wherever, wherever you might be interested. Another mechanism we often use is called the US provisional. And what this is, is it's a full on patent application that we file um, that can be updated within a 12 month window. If you don't go the provisional route, they call it a regular application. And regular applications cannot be updated after they're filed. Provisionals can be. And the government fees for filing a provisional are substantially lower than filing a regular patent. So if you are come up with an initial idea, we can file a patent application on it. And if it's a provisional, then as you go through the R&D process, start sourcing um, vendors, seeing what actually works, um, you know, within that 12 month window, then you can come back to us and say, hey, listen, we, I know we kind of described this as, you know, sim a simple example. We described this as being a nail, but it's actually a lot cheaper and more efficient if we use a screw. Okay, great. Well, we can update the application and um, provide those details. And this is kind of where it gets confusing is this is another 12 month window to keep in mind. But once the application is filed, then you have 12 months to update it and file in other countries. And when you file in those other countries, you can tell them, hey, Canadian Patent Office, I filed this in the US a year ago, so please honor that original date. And for anything described in that first application, they'll honor as a date. So it's 
basically a way of protecting yourself and then you get 12 months file again and then they honor that original date. And the second a patent application is filed, doesn't matter which country, you can mark it as patent pending. Um, might want to be somewhat careful with the wording, but um, you know, the second a provisional is on file, you can, you can start marketing and labeling your products as patent pending. So things to consider uh, when you're looking at what sort of patent process you want to take is obviously your invention has to be new. Um, we have a lot of clients that come in and say, no one's ever done this before. And you say, okay, well, we, you know, we recommend doing a patent search if we think their idea might not have much, much to it. We'll say, nope, I, I've read every book of, you know, talk to every competitor, talk to all the salespeople, nothing like this exists. And sure enough, something like that exists. So um, it is uh, important to do your due diligence to ensure what you're doing is new. Um, otherwise, you'll get kind of down the patent road and the patent office will come back and find something exactly like you did. And unfortunately, you won't be able to get a patent. Um, it's also important to be practical. Patents can be expensive. Um, the costs can be you know, fairly well managed if you kind of stick to your main markets. Canada and US are obviously the two most important for, for a lot of Canadians. Um, once you start looking at Japan, China, um, not only do you have to pay all the government fees, but you have to pay um, a technical translator to translate your document and they charge per word and the cost for that can escalate quite quickly. It's also um, important not to do it yourself. Technically you can file and prepare your own patent application um, if you do, the patent office will probably pick up on it and they'll send you a letter saying, hey, you know, clearly you did this on your own. Um, you know, here's a list of all the patent agents in Canada. We highly recommend that you work with one of them. Um, and sometimes it's, it's a little too late once they reach out to us and they'll say, hey, here's what I filed. And we look at it and say, we, you know, this really can't be salvaged. And if we file something else, it won't be new because this one's already been filed. Um, so it's a bit of a bit of a tricky game with that. Um, a good analogy would be if you wired your house with all your electrical components yourself, it's probably not a good idea. You probably want to get a, a licensed electrician to do it um, just for safety purposes. So what can a patent do for my business? Why would you want to get a patent? Well, I'll be a little blunt here, but you probably are not going to want to sue Google. <laughs> A lot of people think, oh, I got this great idea. I'm going to get a patent and Google's going to rip off my idea and I'm going to sue them. I mean, suing someone in the U.S. over a patent case is, you know, at a bare minimum, one to two million dollar lawsuit. Um, and Google will basically drown you in paperwork. So you basically run out of money. So that's probably not the best idea. Patent is, however, a good business tool. You can exclude others from making, using, or selling your invention. So once you have an issued patent and you see someone knock off your idea, I mean, you can't necessarily go and, you know, lock them up in handcuffs, but you can work with us to send them a letter saying, hey, listen, like we have a patent on this. We think you're infringing. Uh, we'd be open to negotiating some sort of license. So basically they can keep selling their product, but you can profit off of it. Um, or you can send them a cease and desist letter saying, hey, we have a patent on this. Please stop doing what you're doing. Um, and if they don't listen, then you know, you can look at actually suing them, but um, you know, more times, more times often than not, you do not want to go down that road because it's notoriously expensive. Um, software also gives you an opportunity to license or sell the invention. So if you have this great new, you know, a sole for an athletic shoe idea, you can get a patent on it, reach out to Nike and say, hey, listen, let's talk about this. I want to see if you'd be interested in incorporating my invention into your products. Um, and you have a lot more, a lot more of a, a chance of them responding to you if you have a patent on it. Um, some people refer to patents as a currency for innovation. Um, I don't know if you see a lot of the, you know, Apple versus Samsung patent litigation lawsuits. Um, but a lot of times Apple will be infringing 15 of Google's patents and Google will be infringing 15 of Apple's patents. And they kind of just, okay, there's no need to go down that road. Let's just you know, agree to disagree and kind of continue on. So here's a list of the top patentees in the, U in the US uh, from 2019. 
They're obviously big tech companies, IBM, Samsung, Canon, Intel, Microsoft. A good example of a company utilizing patents um, to generate revenue is IBM. They generate, I think it's over this now, but they generate approximately a billion dollars a year just by licensing out their patents. Um, a lot of their technology has to do with telecommunications, um, stuff like that. So basically they'll, they'll allow companies to, to pay them a royalty and, and use their technology. Google's an interesting company when it comes to patents where in 2002, this is their exact quote. They said patents, particularly software patents, are mostly bogus, largely low quality, and used in court by companies that cannot innovate to hurt consumers and stifle true innovators. They were more of kind of the open source mindset where, you know, anytime if someone gets a patent, all they're going to do is sue someone and it stifles innovation, where it's actually been proven that a patent can help um, advance innovation. Where if someone has an invention and they teach everyone how to use it, that people can improve on that, um, which you know is more or less the definition of innovation. Um, so in 2003, Google was awarded four patents, and flash forward 15 years, last in 2018, Google was awarded 2,600 patents. So their their attitude has changed, uh, probably due to the fact that they're now a publicly traded company, due to the fact that they're probably getting a lot of uh, threatening lawsuits. For, um, for any patents. <clears throat> so some of the patents that Google actually have, um, one has to do with social networking updates by comic strips. So they would basically take a, um, a feeling or an emotion from, from what you posted on Twitter, let's say, and they could automatically generate a comic strip based on that. Um, a virtual assistant that tweets and posts on Facebook. Um, which back in the day probably looked kind of weird, but now that Google Home exists, probably makes a lot of sense. Um, they actually got some sort of patent on a heart hand gesture where if your phone recognizes that you do a heart hand gesture, then it can perform some sort of action. Um, another example of patents being used uh, to generate some revenue is Nortel notoriously went bankrupt and they had this huge patent portfolio that was just sitting there and there is a bidding war on it. And this consortium of Apple, Microsoft, RIM, which is now BlackBerry um, and a bunch of other telecommunications companies um, paid $4.5 billion for Nortel's patent portfolio. And again, a lot of those patents had to do with telecommunications. Some of them had to do with the hardware for office phones, um, architecture like that. Um, so that's a pretty, pretty substantial um, amount of money to pay. I think it was estimated each patent was worth roughly $80,000, um, which was just, you know, simple 4.5 billion divided by however many patents were, were part of this portfolio. So can I patent my app? This is um, hopefully a good example to you as to the um, amount of detail that um, is required to actually get a patent. Um, so as the answer in many law, questions go? The answer is maybe. Like you might be able to get a patent for your app. Um, you cannot get a patent on something that doesn't do anything. So if you say, oh, I want to get a, I've invented this great new thing that changes my screen color from red to blue. Yeah, that's not really that much. I mean, it's, you can do that on Microsoft Paint as well. The patentability may lie though in how your app functions. So here's two examples. One is Instagram. Basic idea of Instagram is you upload your pictures online and then friends can like your pictures, write comments, share them with others. If you think about it, that's not that, you know, the functionality is not really you know, record breaking, even though somehow that company is worth so much money. Um, so a basic idea like that, if you submit it to the patent office saying, oh, we got this a method that you, you know, obtain an image and you upload it onto a, you know, a connected network such as the internet and others can view it. I mean, that's not really a good idea. A good example of what could be patented. So that would more, more than likely uh, be the time. A good example of something that could be patented is Tinder. Tinder is an app used for dating. Um, 
But here's the basic idea. You see a picture of someone, and if you're interested in dating them, you swipe right with your finger. You swipe left if you're not interested. And if you do swipe right, then you basically have to sit there and wait and hope that that person also chooses you. And if you do, then the app allows you to start chatting with one another. So if you're reading that, it doesn't sound that technical, but it seems like an interesting idea. So I've actually I've pulled out some features from their actual patent just to show you the level of detail that they provided. So how does this actually work? Well, we have terminal 10, which is a fancy patent word for a computer. Um, it's got users 14. The, the terminals are connected via a network or to a network 24. And that's more than likely via um, some sort of connection 22, which could be a wired or wireless connection. Um, and also connected to the network is a server. And they've called it a matching server. So the matching server probably is a database it includes the records of users. So Jane Doe, Jane Roe, Jane Bo, Jane Low <laughs> lists all the users that are, um, have signed up for Tinder and has all these properties. So that could be used for matching, such as, you know, if you say you're only interested in someone aged 30 to 40, that could be listed in property one. Um, property two could be something else like location. Uh, and based on that criteria, they could probably, you know, pull out a subset of people that you might want to be interested in, in dating. Um, and then figure 1F is one of the records from that database. So Jane Doe is her contact information, her birthday, her hometown, her likes, her dislikes, a bunch of information that can be used for matching purposes. The methodology is shown here. They generate a user pool, which is more or less saying people sign up for Tinder. They display the user pool, receive a preference from a user. So basically, you, a user preference would be, oh, I'm interested in dating someone age 30 to 35. And then they have a decision here. Does the first user like the second user? So if someone pulls up their phone and they get, um, you know, a candidate, let's call them, um, displayed on their phone, they can swipe left or right. You'll notice here it doesn't say swipe left or right. Um, that could be a, a feature in another example. Basically, it's do they like them or not? And if they say yes, then the second user will um, get provided the option. Do you like this first user? If they say yes, then the app will allow their, them to communicate with one another. If no, then they'll store the first user's preference and they will not allow communication between the first and the second user. Here's the additional figures that were included with the patent. So as you see Sally's pictures there, if you go left, it says nope. If you go right, it says like. And if you match with each other, then you get you and Sally have been matched, send a message or keep playing. So this patent was issued August, 2017 um, as US patent number 9733811. And I'll give you the patent claim that they were, the main patent claim that they were given. It's fairly detailed. Um, so as you can see, the beginning is called a preamble. It says a computer implemented method of profile matching. Um, and then that comprises, and then all these various steps. So you electronically receive um, dating profiles. Each profile has traits of a user associated with the social networking platform. So traits, again, would be, um, you know, age. Um, social networking platform would be Tinder. You electronically receive a first request for matching. So this is obviously done at the point of the Tinder server as opposed to your mobile device. So they receive a request for matching. The request is um, received from someone's electronic device. And you determine a set of potential matches based on which criteria you probably enter, such as age. Um, and then you display graphical representation. Then they determine if the first user expressed a positive preference indication regarding the first potential match. Um, determining that the first user performed a first swiping gesture associated with the graphical representation on the graphical user interface. So that's how you say swipe right in patent terminology. 
Um, and then this further continues if once the first person has indicated they're interested, they determine the second user's um, interested and basically determining to enable communication between the first and second user if they both expressed interest. And then a few more steps where you determine if they're not interested and if they haven't, then they determine to prevent communication between the first user and the fourth user, fourth user being someone else in the database. And yeah, that's um, the most real world example I could provide of um, an app being patented and how much um, textbook detail would be uh, required. I think that is it. Um, I assume some people may have some questions, so I can uh, turn it back over to Steve to see if he wants to moderate that portion. Sure, thanks Kelly. If uh, anybody does have any questions, feel free to post those in the chat and then we can uh, start from there. Um, in the meantime, thank you Kelly for the presentation. I think there's a lot of great and useful information there. Um, things that you might've assumed with patents that uh, may not be the case. Um, so we are getting a question in here from Louise. Um, if it's methodology and it's created in partnership with an educational institution, is that patentable? So it's a methodology created with an educational institution? If yes, if it's a methodology and it's created in partnership with an educational institution. So that's, um, I guess a, t a difficult one to give a yes or no to. Um, what I would say is if it has some sort of technical advantage, um, then it's likely eligible to be patented. Um, if it's a simple, what they call a business method, where it's, um, you know, a method of running a classroom or, a, you know, a learning, <clears throat> like a learning um, kind of platform, then, then that might not be patentable. Um, it would be more kind of the technical aspect of it, where I guess a good example would be Smart Technologies, which is a Calgary company that had digital whiteboards where a lot of their technology was connecting the classroom where students would be given um, like a buzzer to answer questions to the teacher. So they probably wouldn't get a patent on, you know, a teacher asking questions and students answering them with a buzzer. It would be more connecting the buzzer to the teacher's computer and, you know, associating a student with them. And if there's a hierarchy of students that answer it, how they determine, you know, which answer to field versus the other or something like that. Okay. Would it also depend then, Kelly, on uh, the relationship with the educational institution? I know the, the research divisions of those institutions sometimes have, um, they differ on whether or not they, uh, you know, certain post-secondary institutions allow uh, people to use IP created with the educational institution and some don't if they're required to retain internal Right, yeah, a lot of it would have to come down to the contractor agreement where um, like a professor at University A might be given um, in his contract, you know, full rights to his inventions where University B might say, hey, anything you, you know, you invent, you know, we'll, we'll happily fund the patent for you, but we own the patent. You'd be listed as the inventor, um, but we would own the rights to the patent. Um, and if you're working as kind of like company A is working with company B, then it's important to kind of clear that up either through a contract or through a meeting um, as to, okay, who's going to own the rights to it? Are we both going to, um, or is it only going to be one of us? And if, if it's just one of us, are you okay with that? Um, you know, we'll grant you a license to it anyway, or, or we won't grant you a license. Or, um, those are all kind of good, good questions that um, if you don't settle up at the beginning can become quite, quite uh, difficult to negotiate after the fact. Another question coming in uh, from Jay. Uh, how much does it cost to file a patent for a specific software application? The, the cost to file a patent application vary um, based on the technology. A good estimate for a software-based application, the upfront costs would probably be, I would say, you know, eight to twelve thousand dollars, and then that would basically be to prepare the application. 
And then it depends on which countries you like to file in. Each country has their own government fees. Um, if you kept it within Canada and the US, then you'd probably be looking at an additional three to 5,000 for the government fees. And then that, that basically buys you that two years until they start arguing back and forth. And then each round of arguing kind of depends on, you know, how many references they find um, and how much, how much work we have to do basically to, to argue back. Okay. So about eight to 10 to file just on average and another three to five for the government side. And then depending on how much goes back and forth, you're going to go up from there. Yeah. Yeah. And if, if people want kind of more, more detailed estimates, we can always uh, chat offline about them just, just to see. Another thing, Kelly, using your example with um, Tinder, in yep. the sake of technology, things move so rapidly now. So assuming that Tinder applied for their application years prior, it was under patent pending, and then you know throughout that whole process, if somebody else was to implement something extremely similar in that time period while that was still under um, uh, assessment, would they be able to, to use that still or would they then have to license once that patent is um, issued? So basically how the courts would decide it is they provide different calculations based on kind of what phase the patent was at. So once it's published, um, the people could be put on notice that, hey, we've got a patent pending on this and you can read that document. You won't know exactly the scope of protection they'll be granted, which is defined by that kind of claim one that I showed. Mm -hmm. um, so basically, if you're found to infringe claim one, then they could basically, they do calculation A from when it was issued to the present day, and calculation B from when it was published, AKA you were put on notice to when it was issued. And that would be slightly lesser because they say, well, it wasn't exactly clear what claim they're gonna be given, but you had a good idea that, that what they were doing was out there. I mean, a good example was um, that company Bumble. Um, Tinder eventually sued them for, for patent infringement, basically because their, their app functions in a very similar manner. And I think one of the ex-employees of Tinder went to Bumble to start this. Um, I don't know exactly what the damages were, were calculated as. I think it may have been settled, but um, yeah, I think they were pretty active with that. Any other questions from the group? Uh, we have another one here, Kelly. Uh, okay. Can the owner of the patent sell the rights to specific geographic locations based on arrangements um, signed? This will be for software applications installed. So again, so, would they sell the rights to specific geographic locations? So a patent itself, um, let's say you have one in the US and Canada, and you, you could technically sell the US patent but keep the Canadian one in your name. Uh, if you're talking, say, provincial, then that would be more of a, a licensing agreement that you would negotiate where you say, I'll grant you the rights or exclusive rights to this patent um, in Alberta, uh, but Alberta only. Um, and I maintain the rights, you know, everywhere else in Canada, something like that. Um, but you couldn't technically sell the patent to a new owner only in Alberta. Um, it would have to be kind of nationwide, whatever, whatever country that patent is issued in. Okay. Not seeing any other questions at the moment. Okay. I think with that, um, I just want to thank you again, Kelly, for your time today. I think it was really insightful. Uh, for everybody that is on the call, we have recorded the uh, presentation today and we can share that 
And if you do have any other further questions, feel free to get in contact with us at Innovate Niagara. You can reference uh, this specific uh, training session and we would be happy to uh, introduce you to Kelly if you would like more information. And then I also see Kelly's uh, on the slide right now. Kelly has his email address there. I'm sure you'd be happy to facilitate any questions directly. Indeed. So with that, I want to thank everyone for their time and uh, for logging in. This was, this was uh, originally an in-person uh, presentation, but obviously the times have changed. So I, I appreciate everyone uh, showing interest. Excellent. Well, thank you very much and have a great day, everyone. You as well.